See you streaming on YouTube. I don't know if the audio is working. Can someone just confirm that the audio is working? Say something. Say something. I believe. Okay. Uh, so it looks like we're, we're live. So, seeing if you're live, uh, you can confirm we're live. Uh, greetings, everybody, from wherever you may be, uh, from Lexus Aurora. Um, and thanks for being here. Today we've got an exciting speaker. Um, this is Thomas, and Thomas is going to talk about aquaponics today. And the, the exciting thing about what Thomas is doing is a lot of the speakers, we're designers and scientists trying to solve problems for Mars. Um, and Thomas is all of those things, plus he's one more thing, he's actually building the infrastructure, he's actually doing the things that we want to do to get people on Mars at the moment. And he's testing some of the very first uh, aquaponic systems that will hopefully be used on Mars, and this will help set the pace. So, uh, Thomas, welcome. Thank you. So, uh, my name is um, Thomas Bjelkeman Pettersson. I'm based in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, have a presentation. I'll just go through a little bit quickly about what the presentation will cover. Um, so you should be seeing the content page that says, who am I? Uh, what is aquaponics? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about my company, Johannes uh, Urban Farms, what we're building, um, why we think this is relevant for uh, potential Mars colony, how this could be done on Mars. We're going to talk a little bit about numbers, and then we have time for questions. Um, I hope that sounds good. So let's just yeah. dive straight into it. So my name is Thomas. Uh, i am uh, been working with starting companies for the last 30 years, primarily in the uh, internet and data. Um, I've started companies in, in the UK, in the United States, in the Netherlands, um, sort of starting started one in India as well as here in Sweden where I'm based now. Um, I uh, I nearly have a, um, a Master of Science in Environmental Science. Um, I actually never finished my, uh, my thesis, Master's thesis, primarily because I was working on uh, a new startup at that point. Uh, I also have just recently completed a year tr uh, training in fish farming. Um, the last uh, organization I started was Aquo Foundation. Um, uh, we work with uh, collecting data, uh, building data systems and data processes that people uh, in countries in primarily in Africa but also in South Asia and Pacific use um, to to really look at how do we collect data that's needed to to work on the sustainable development goals. So among other things, we have probably the world's largest drinking water database for rural areas with 100, about 100, 130 million people covered, uh, primarily in West Africa, but all the way out to Fiji. Um, last company um, that we're working on is Johanna Stadsoglinger, that's urban farms in Swedish. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The, the picture you can see of me there is me in uh, Seawater Greenhouse, Australia, uh, when I was there to do my master thesis. Uh, and I'm also a bass player in a metal band. So, aquaponics, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so what is aquaponics? Uh, simply said, uh, we can say that aquaponics is a circular food production system that uses uh, fish bacteria to grow vegetables. So simply said, you can, you can say you, you, you feed the fish that you have in your system. Um, when you breathe in and out, when you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, a fish that has recently eaten, they breathe out ammonia. Uh, ammonia is poisonous to the fish. Um, in, 
you know, in similar ways to carbon dioxide at high levels of poisonous to us, but at much lower level of poisonous for the fish. Um, and then, so you have to have bacteria cultures in your system that drive what's called an nitrification process. Um, and and uh, they convert the, the ammonia eventually to nitrite, which is a, a micronutrient for plots. And then the plots eat that up, and together the bacteria and the plots filter the water so they can go back to the fish. Uh, so in a circular system, and we'll see more about this. So the, the, the key process here is the nitrification process. So the uh, ammonia that, that comes out of the fish um, gets converted to nitrite um, by particular sets of bacteria, and other bacteria convert the nitrite to nitrate, and then the, the plants eat up the nitrate. Uh, so that that's the, the sort of simple version. Um, we can see on this diagram, and I'm not actually going to go through this, this just covers the nitrate, nit nitrogen parts. Uh, it's actually a quite a complicated biological, chemical biological process around this. There are many more uh, nutrients involved, etc., to make all this work. Um, the, the nice thing is that once you've got it up and running, you don't actually need to do much about it yourself. It's a small, you know, it's a, it's a micro ecosystem. Uh, it does essentially all the work by yourself. You have to support it a little bit with the uh, nutrients and, uh, so, you know, uh, you have to add some extra nutrients and stuff, but in general, it runs all by itself, even if it's really complicated, like when you look at it scientifically. So, uh, why aquaponics? Um, an aquaponics system, apart from the fish that you grow, um, you can also grow many different types of fruit, many different types of vegetables. The, the picture you see on the right, um, the guy at the bottom there, he, uh, Bjorn Oliviuson, he has a small facility that you see the, the geodesic dome here south of Stockholm in Sweden, where he has tilapia fish and uh, he grows only trop tropical uh, fruits, so mangoes, bananas and stuff. So you can actually do that. Uh, our system uh, uses more uh, other things, uh, salads and herbs, but you can actually do this as well. It's a circular energy material and nutrient flows type system, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it, uh, the system uses very low nutrient levels for the plants, uh, and, and you get really nice high yields out of the system. Uh, compared to hydroponics, uh, an example, um, you want about 400 ppm um, is recommended of uh, nitrites, uh, nitrates, sorry, uh, for a salad uh, in a hydroponic system. Our system runs between 12 and 20, so um, we're down to 20th of the nutrients in the system and we still have really, really good growth. And what happens there is that the microbiology, uh, probably more the stuff that comes primarily from the intestine of the fish, uh, helps uh, the plants take up the nutrients. So you, so you get like lots of beneficial action between the plant and the, uh, and the actual fish. Uh, once it's up and running and it's been running for a while, it becomes a very stable environment, uh, which is very nice. Uh, that, you know, there, there isn't much you need to do about it most of the time. Uh, the plants produce excess oxygen. Um, that would be really useful in a, uh, on a Mars base. Um, it's an actual water purification system, um, and it's able to run semi-closed. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So there are some drawbacks to aquaponics. Um, there are complex systems to design, build, and manage. Um, we spent the last two years building, designing ours. Um, it's a costly technical infrastructure to get it up and running, but I mean, anything that you do on Mars is going to be too. Um, it has relatively high energy costs, uh, particularly the way we're looking at the system, but, but in general, it does, and then um, there are certain types of pro uh, things that you would like to grow, maybe cereals, 
you know, tubers like potatoes and stuff, they're harder to grow in these systems that might not be economically viable. Um, just a very brief history about aquaponics, just so that we understand where it comes from. It's uh, aquaponics is very old. I mean, in China, people have had carp in their rice paddies uh, for a very long time. Um, here is some picture of uh, uh, American Indians, you know, having fish in their in their um, uh, growing environment. Um, in the uh, mid '80s, uh, a bunch of American uh, scientists started working on looking at mixing fish into greenhouses. So here's some articles about that. Um, but the most work that people know about, and it's probably they've done the majority heavy, heavy lifting is the University of Virgin Islands have done aquaponic systems and uh, here are some pictures from the University of Virgin Islands no, I haven't been there because part of these pictures um, a typical outdoor aquaponic system in sort of part, partial covered polytunnels uh, growing salads in what's called a deep water culture system so floating rafts um, you can also do aquaponics and other types of system. On the left, so you got um, towers, um, so that you trickle down the water down the towers. On the right, uh, a picture from uh, Uberus Farms in Hoffman Bay, California, where we've been to visit, uh, where you grow, they partially grow media beds um, with uh, ebb and flow water systems. So you can do this in different ways. Um, so what are we working on? Um, so at Johanna's, uh, we've got this uh, aquaponic system at the top. Um, we started working on this, but when we wanted to start working on it, we didn't really just want to have a food production, sort of a salad growing facility that also produces fish. We were thinking, okay, how can we get rid of all the other externalities that, you know, food production causes, like problems that you normally offload onto others. Um, so, you know, uh, if you look at uh, fish aquaculture, when you grow fish in open pen systems, like for example in Norway, there's a lot of open pen systems in the ocean that where they grow um, uh, salmon, uh, they essentially dump all of those excess nutrients out into the ocean to be uh, distributed out into the ocean. Uh, it causes all sorts of trouble. Um, the ocean is relatively big. What we know in the end is like with uh, carbon dioxide, at some point there is a limit to what the ocean can take. Um, so we want to handle that, that nutrient uh, internally and make use of it because we think it's really valuable. Um, if we get any solid waste out of our system that gets put uh, on the, onto the local agriculture around our facility, um, and then, of course, we produce vegetable and fish that goes to consumers. Uh, but we're also now looking to take uh, food waste from the process um, and use that. So I don't know if you know that in Europe, it's estimated that 56% of all fruit and vegetables that's produced is thrown away before it's eaten. So more than half. About half of that is thrown away before it even reaches the customer. Um, so we're looking to take some of that uh, uh, fruit and vegetables and recover that, feed it to insects, make uh, fish feed out of the insects and put it back into the system. Uh, and we've just had a government grant together with a consortium organizations, including uh, one of the bigger waste management companies in Sweden, biggest uh, uh, insect grower, and we and a few others to actually do this process. We just had a grant of another $500,000 as part of what we were working on. Um, we also, I come from a digital background, um, so I also believe that there's no point in implementing modern systems if you don't. Uh, put technology in for digitizing all of this and tracking and tracing it. Uh, so we spent quite a lot of effort on doing that. I'll show you that a little bit later as well. So that's what we're working on. Uh, here's a picture from the inside of our facility. Um, so in front here you see different types of salads and herbs growing. Um, 
it's currently running at about uh, half capacity because the volume of fish we have in the system doesn't really provide enough nutrients for more than that. Um, to the right, up at the back, you see the round big fish tanks. Um, there's about 10 cubic meters in each of those nine and a half or so where we have rainbow trout. Uh, and then to the left are the black tanks. Uh, one of those is a, a filter, is called a moving bed bioreactor. Behind that is also a drum filter that takes away the solids. I have a little, very brief video. We'll see if that one works. Uh, if I click here, that just shows the same thing. But, um, you know, just me walking with my phone along here to show you how all these plants grow in our system. Um, at the very end here, you also see some of the data from our data systems, uh, keeping track of everything. We measure everything every minute in our system. Uh, we also do uh, manual tests uh, once a week and things like that. Oops. Uh, I'm going to see if, how do we go to the next one there? Here we go to the next one. And then um, here's the grower in our system. She's in front, standing next to one of our interns. Um, we have another room uh, which contains where we the, what we call the seedling room, where we plant from seed. You see those uh, hooded areas there where th plants are for a week after we put them in for seed, and then they stay in the other tables for two, two to four weeks before they get planted out into the main troughs. And the reason why we have a separate little room for this is because it's a lot cheaper to run them here. They stand much more compact here. They don't use so much power, etc. So it's a good way of getting them propagated up. Uh, outside, we have a separate building about um, 35 square meters or so, which contains the sump tank where the water runs all the way through from our system. It's, it's uh, gravity fed the whole way. We pump with one pump from the sump tank up to the fish tanks, and then it runs all the way back out to the sump tank all by itself. Uh, in here, we inject more air. The air pumps are sitting on the back wall there. You see the five things sitting on the shelves. Those are the air pumps that push air into the system. Not only do we do that so that the fish have good oxygen supply, uh, the bacteria needs air, uh, oxygen in the system, and the plants also need oxygen around their roots. Uh, on the left, there is a box that contains uh, computers for sensor data. So we have the actual sensor data platform is lying at the front there. It was being maintained when we took this photograph. Um, we also have, on the outside, we have a um, three meter by three meter type container with a, a diesel generator because this system is not allowed to run without, can't run without power. It, you know, if it runs, if the power goes, um, then we have about 45 minutes to an hour before the fish dies. Um, so it, uh, we really need uh, to be sure that uh, power can be provided to the pumps at any point in time. So this system kicks in automatically when uh, if the power goes, and then I get phone calls automatically on my phone and SMSs and stuff saying the power is gone. I need to go and make sure everything is running smoothly. Um, digital. Uh, I'll talk briefly about this as well. Um, the um, uh, I mean, I, I could spend um, a whole session just talking about the digital stuff. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to introduce it. The middle stuff here, uh, water and air sensors, they're real time. In other words, once a minute, they measure something and send up data to our cloud uh, application that also stores data locally. Uh, we do water quality nutrient tests. Uh, they're uh, manual at this point. You could automate some of those, but they become really, really expensive to do. So we we do them manually, and then we enter the data in the database. Um, we have a production management app uh, that keeps track of every uh, tray that we sow, goes out to the raft, so we know exactly how long time everything takes when we harvest things. And we're also now doing a plant 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 management in a, or seed management. How often you go to seed things to have what what you want supplied, uh, you know four to eight weeks later. So it keeps, you know, it, it allows us to sort of say, I want this produced eight weeks from now, so I can sell that. What do I need to plant when? 
Uh, so we're working on that at the moment. Eventually, all that data should be able to go into mach machine learning, so we can do things like production advice. Uh, it should interact with our operations control and sales management. Um, we're also during the um, winter going to take some of that data and write to a distributed ledger, a blockchain type system, which is Hyperledger, uh, so that we can provide traceability and transparency to our system. In other words, I want to be able to prove that where the things that you eat, where they came from. I want to be able to tell exactly how much energy was used, what nutrients was used, etc. So you can see uh, how, you know, the environmental impact our system, the food that you eat have through our system. Uh, if, if you have sort of quality, you know, ecological food or whatever, today, if you go and buy something in the store, it has a stamp on it that says ecological. You cannot know anything beyond that. It's often completely transparent. We want to make that transparent for people. So that's part of what we do as well. Uh, so here's uh, some screenshots from the production management systems uh, used on the uh, mobile phone when we work on it. Uh, here's uh, some of the more technical data from our um, every minute dashboards. You know, this is in Swedish, so it might be hard to interpret what you see there. But you know, you see power consumption, total power consumption, temperatures in different places, water consumption, etc. So next facility that we're building, if you look at this picture, look down right, that's the actual facility that I showed you the photographs of. It's in an old cow barn uh, that we've converted into this facility. Uh, to the left, we're gonna take over a space that's twice as big as what we have at the moment. Uh, and we're gonna put in the, the big fish farm in there. Uh, we're gonna have 150 cubic meters worth of uh, fish tanks, 10 fish tanks, 15 cubic meters each. Um, it's, uh, well, in Sweden, when you talk about fish farming, you talk about the feed you give them, uh, and that more or less converts one to one, not quite, but nearly, uh, to fish. So it's a 40 ton system, which means that we'll feed them 40 tons of fish food every year, so more than 100 kilos a day, uh, and they will produce about 36 tons worth of fish. On the far end, you see another building. We're going to build a new building where we're going to put in vertical growing facility. Um, in the current pilot we have, we have 95 square meters of growing area uh, connected in our system. Uh, the vertical growing facility has four cells, 10 floors in each cell. Each floor has 92 square meters of growing area. So, so that system I'm showing at the back there is 40 times bigger than the system that we're running at the moment. So we're currently working on financing for that. Uh, it will contain a, a modern, you know, what's called a recircular aquaculture system, RAS, as we call it. You know, it's automated fish growing, right? You have fish tanks, uh, you have the you know, mechanical filter, which is in this case a drum filter, takes away all the sort of the fish poo, essentially. And, and residuals from fish food that doesn't get eaten. You have the uh, other pieces like uh, biofilters, degassing, you know, oxygen supply, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, this isn't exactly our loop that we're going to run, but you know, it, it describes the general principle of how these things work. Uh, we're going to have an automated plant growing system. Uh, from a Dutch company called Our Techno. Uh, this gives uh, an impression of it. Uh, it takes care of, you know, you seed uh, either manually or automatically with machines. Um, the, the trays with the plants gets transported into the cell, get lifted up to the right level through lifts internally or monitored with cameras and stuff internally and sensors. When they're ready, they come back out and you can either automate automatically harvest them or harvest them by hand. In the long run, we're going to have aut automatic harvesting of this. And there's another picture of it, but sort of with a bit of transparency to sh show you the concept of multiple layers of these. Uh, of course, inside, and this is all inside, our whole facility, I've forgotten to say that, our whole facility is a indoors facility, so we light everything with LEDs. Uh, it, it uses energy, but it's not by far the biggest uh, cost component of the system, actually. 
uh, it's the, the biggest cost component in our business plan is our people. People cost money. So the more automation you can do in the long run, uh, the more cost effective this system is going to be. Um, if you want to learn more about aquaponics, um, there's lots to learn. They're quite complicated systems. Uh, uh, the fish part, uh, depending a bit what type of fish you do, if you grow tilapia, for example, then it's much easier. They're very, very tolerant fish. But if you do something like we do, rainbow trout, uh, then you actually have to go and learn how to take care of fish properly. Uh, I would recommend, if you want to start, look at the FAO manual, Small Scale Aquaponics. It's very good. I started there. Then I read the, the Aquaponics Farmer Canadian book. Uh, we like that one because if they could do a polytunnel in the snow in Canada, we could do indoor farming in Sweden. There was no question about it. They also run a, what they call a cold water farm, so they do trout as well. So that's a very useful book. Um, so. Why is this relevant for a Mars colony? Huh? Well, I mean, I think there's, I, I, I'm not going to cover everything. Uh, you know, Mars colony, obviously you need food and oxygen. Uh, a system like this provides some of that. Um, don't get me wrong, right? Obviously you can't live off salads and herbs only and fish. That's not going to work. You're going to need other things too. But you're going to want those things as well. So we think this is really useful, right? Um, the Mars colony will be resource constrained. You need to be able to live on in situ resources to having circular food production systems. I think it really going to help. I actually think you're not going to be able to make anything like a million person city without proper circular food production systems. Um, and eventually I believe firmly that you're going to need ecosystems on in your environments that you live in um, and they're going to be complex but in the short run you need to start with something simple and those simple ecosystems you need to learn practice work on all the people that work in these environments need to have experience etc and, and aquaponic systems are great um, learning systems i believe um, and you know we actually need this stuff on earth in sweden we uh, import 70 80%, something like that, of all the fish and vegetables that we eat. Um, so we're doing this here in Sweden to feed stock on the city. Um, but the uh, everything we learn, we think is, you know, very translatable to a, a Mars colony. Um, I think, as I said, I think you need something more complicated in the long run. Um, the In the last uh, grant application that we got money for, we had a very similar picture to this one, which looks sort of like the first one we looked at when we started about talking about what we do at Johannes, uh, my company. Um, but it has more pieces in it. You know, you 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 can uh, you know grow things like algae, uh, mussels, etc. Uh, and and there are many ways where. This goes back and forth between the different uh, things. So, for example, the the the, the poo from the insects uh, turns out to be really, really good nutrients, uh, nutrient supply, and and uh, soil improver uh, as well. So, you know, you can take whatever that comes out of the insects and put it back into your agriculture, for example, even if you know they. Insects might eat part agricultural products as well. So the, it's really interesting, you know, it's a, you want essentially a compli more complicated system uh, to get it more robust and resilient uh, and also to get more things out of it. Um, so some numbers then. Uh, we call this the dark side of the black napkin because uh, Simon, uh, an architect, prompted me to do some of this work and he asked me loads and loads of questions without him. Thanks, Simon, I know you're here. Without it, it wouldn't have been done. So uh, so we sat sketched on you know this when we were talking um, to see if we could come up with some numbers. And some of these numbers are dubious, so take them with you know a healthy amount of salt, right? 
Uh, one of these containers in the Arc Techno system, so 920 square meters uh, of vegetable cultivation area, there's like 10 levels. Um, you know, it has about 37,000 plants in it, produces 325,000 plants a year. It's seven by seven by 22 meters long. Uh, and you need some area around it, planting, harvesting, processing area, you know, pumps, water, blah, blah, blah. Those kind of things. Add an extra 300 square meters, maybe. Uh, and then you need a logistics area where, where you store the plants, where you, you know, you, you cool them, you prepare them for transport to where they're going to be eaten, etc. Um, you need about, for the, this one cell, you need about a third of um, the fish system that we're looking at to build ourselves. So say 40 cubic meter fish system produces maybe uh, 12, 15 tons of fish a year, takes up 300 square meters of space. Uh, and you need some extra space maybe, or t you need some extra tanks for eggs, fry and smolt, in other words, to small fish before they become a little bit bigger. And what we call the clearing tank, uh, after the fish, after, after the fish uh, are uh, ready to be eaten, you want to have, have them go in, in fresh water uh, that's not connected to the system, otherwise they get a sort of earthy taste. You need one fish farmer, probably two plant farmers to keep track of this and a bunch of infrastructure. So that's the prerequisites. What do we get? Um, you know, it's going to output 25 kilos of um, input, 25 kilos of fish uh, every minute. Yeah, uh, every minute, sorry. Somebody came and told me something here. So 25 kilos of fish every day, um, that's going to produce about 22 kilos of fish. Uh, you're going to consume about 2,800 kilowatt hours of electricity. You need about a litre a minute um, that goes into things like the drum, drum filter and whatever that can be recovered somewhere else along the way. Uh, it's 99% 99.99% of recycling in a system like this. Our pilot is running at 99.75 at the moment, but we're not recovering all the water that we could do. Um, we're going to do that later. Um, it's going to produce approx uh, consume approximately 12 kilos of um, uh, oxygen and 5 kilos of oxygen for the bacteria and plants. The fish take to like a uh, well, three quarters of that. Uh, it's going to produce, or input, you're going to consume carbon dioxide as well. Uh, obviously, that is easier on Mars because the thin atmosphere there is there has a lot of carbon dioxide in it, so we could take that in from the outside and then produce oxygen from it. Outputs, 1,000 plants a day, um, uh, 22 kilos of fish, as I said, 10 kilos of fish waste that can be uh, recycled in different ways and maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 kilos of oxygen, spare oxygen. Uh, sorry, no oxygen. Uh, some of that will obviously be used by the fish. So we consume, according to NASA, about 0.85 kilos of oxygen per day. Depend after we've let the fish, and the bacteria, etc., take their bits, there's between 4 and 14 kilos of oxygen left. Um, and then the operators need to breathe, the people that run this, and then there's more, there's spare oxygen left for 2 to 14 people, something like that. And then these people together have, uh, you know, 10,000 plants and 22 kilos of fish to eat every day. So, you know, that could actually work. Um, so, um, maybe we should rename our company urban farms into planetary food systems, I'm not sure. Um, maybe that's a future in that in the long run. Um, so what next? Um, I actually would like to build something, uh, take uh, a closed container, uh, you know, 20 foot, 40 foot, I don't know, container, uh, seal it off, measure everything that goes in, goes out properly, um, and see how close we could get to 
uh, understanding the numbers properly. Um, maybe we could do that as a Kickstarter one day. Um, put some students on working on it uh, next to our facility. That would be quite interesting. So, um, yeah. That was my quick run through of what is aquaponics? Um, what do we do? How can this be applicable for Mars? Um, obviously, there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done before this can be done on another planet. Um, but, you know, um, I'm interested in working on it. Uh, we're working on it for real here for uh, local production in uh, uh, Sweden. And hopefully one day we'd be able to help people put this up uh, on Moon or the Mars. So that's me. Question. Thank, Thank you, Thomas. That was extremely informative. Um, and <laughs> we actually have a lot of questions. Normally after after one of these streams, we got like uh, you know, maybe five or six questions, but um, there are a lot of questions. I'm unfortunately not, don't think I'll be able to ask all of them because there's uh, adding I think the questions are coming in quicker than we can realistically answer them. Um, just one quick takeaway from me, and maybe it's something you can comment on about your experience, is um, I, I often have this thought about um, your uh, a quick, rich scheme usually takes about 10 years to get off the ground. Um, we're basically saying it takes a really long time to come from the original idea until um, how until the day that we actually realize the goals that we're, we're set out. Can you quickly tell us about your experiences, how you thought about doing this, how where did you start from, and how did you get to where you are today? Um, mostly also to inspire other people who want to do something realistically that will practically be used on Mars, but just share that experience with us, please. Absolutely. So, so um, I've been interested in sustainable food production for a long time, but I've not actually, I, I didn't start working in it until practically two years ago. Uh, uh, I've been working in IT most of my life. I've been, you know, setting up companies, starting new companies for more or less 30 years. So I've been learning a lot along the way. Um, I took a break, oh, it's a long time ago, that was 15 years ago, I took a break. Um, and uh, went back to university to do that environment, th that um, master's in environmental science that I really felt, felt I needed to be able to do this work. Um, so that was really good. Uh, I studied at Stockholm University. Um, then I went back, um, ended up work setting up Aqua Foundation with a bunch of friends, uh, which was turned out to be quite good as well. That's helping people all across the world in different ways. Um, but then um, I've been looking, i actually been participating as a volunteer with something called Seawater Greenhouse, which if, if you're interested in sustainable um, food production, you should look that up. Um, it's Charlie Payton, um, inventor in the UK, they invented something, but it's very different than what we do. Um, it's, uh, what should we say? Uh, coastal desert uh, greenhouses. Uh, they built the world's first commercial version of this in southern Australia, which I went to see. Uh, it's now probably one of Australia's biggest tomato production facilities on the coastal desert, which is really amazing. So, so <clears throat> uh, a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago or so, maybe, um, went to the science fiction convention Worldcon in uh, Helsinki. There was a lot of talk about Mars, um, everything from uh, NASA scientists to enthusiasts. And I was like, hmm, what can I do to get to Mars? Um, and I revisited thinking about uh, food production, and ended up looking at aquaponics again, because I looked at it you know, 10 years earlier, didn't feel quite that it was ready yet. Now it felt like it was, and we wanted to spend more time in Sweden working rather than jetting all across the world like I was doing before. So we were like, okay, let's give this a go. Uh, uh, the economics work out for Sweden. Um, uh, and uh, we started getting going. Uh, we've been spending two years, two and a half years now since we started the company, but 
uh, we've been building this facility in our spare time, uh, weekends and uh, evenings or whatever. Um, and then uh, the last year and a half, I've been working on it full time myself, including the studies I did. So it does take time. Um, uh, you know, aquaponics, uh, you know, University of Virgin Islands started 30 years ago looking at this. Um, it does take time before it comes to fruition, but, um, you know, there, there are there are many of these things going on at the moment in different parts of the world. You can join them, uh, or you can start your own, it, it, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question from somebody by the name of Water Crusader. Um, I presume he's from the hydro subreddit. And he asked, what sort of metrics do you keep on the graphs on your monitor? And what are you monitoring? We're monitoring a bunch of things. Um, so in the water, we monitor every minute, we monitor oxygen supply, uh, we monitor uh, pH, we monitor temperature and electric conductivity. Um, those are all, they should all st remain stable and nice flat curves all the time. Um, Every week, uh, when the system is running stable, we monitor nu different nutrients. We look at um, or, or the things that we need to get rid of. So ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, um, iron. We look at uh, uh, f phosphorus. Uh, we look at uh, what about more calcium? Sorry, for potassium. I mean, and. Um, uh, alkalinity, total hardness, those kind of things we measure every week uh, with uh, uh, photometers. So, you know, spectrometer type, uh, it's not quite a spectrometer, but a little handheld device. Uh, in the air, we also measure air temperature, carbon dioxide levels. Uh, we measure, are the lights on? Can we see that the lights are on? We measure the electricity. We measure our internet connection. Uh, we measure our, you know, just our sensors, are they running properly? Um, so, so there's a whole bunch of those things that we measure. And then also, of course, we measure, we, we log um, uh, whether we have fish that die or we log uh, how our plants are going through our system, but that's all logged manually. It's quite a lot, obviously. <laughs> Uh, I've got a question from uh, a chap by the name of BBC Fun Freak, um, and he's asking how much would a system like this cost if you want to implement it at home? Um, but I think you can go maybe a little bit further. Can you give us more or less an idea of like what are the big costs to making this viable um, for everybody on Earth, and um, what do you foresee the the cost breakdown will be on something like this going to Mars? Is it even something that you can consider at the moment? Yeah, so, so um, I mean, you can do these kind of things at home relatively cheaply. Uh, I re really recommend um, uh, check the FAO manual that I showed in the presentation that has like how you do this with the cheapest way possible. Um, uh, our system is, is not economically viable at this scale that we've done the pilot system, right? Uh, so that uh, cost about a million and a half Swedish, or say, say under fifty thousand US dollars, or something like that, uh, to build, uh, and the majority of that is essentially it's all hardware. We haven't taken any salaries, um, and we actually have no rent at the moment either, because one of our founders uh, owns the farm. Um, so the the lamps, LED lamps, uh, individually, the the most expensive part. Uh, cost about twenty thousand dollars or so. Um, I mean, we are converting top of my head now. So um, the electric generator with container and everything, uh, ten thousand, um, and then uh, electrician—not the electrician it's himself, uh, but the all the cabling and lamps and connectors and all of that stuff was relatively expensive. Um, uh, and then the rest is just distributed over many, many different pieces of equipment that we built, fish tanks, filters, you know, you name it. But um, 
we built that thing for about hundred fifty thousand dollars in hardware costs. Uh, our next facility is many many times that price. Uh, it's more in the millions. So that's obviously your your cost per unit decrease with the size of the facility, um, and especially you're you're now talking about your stacked. Um, farming where you've got these multiple tiers. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Because that is extremely interesting. Um, because I believe you, you also talked about automating a part of that. Yeah. So so the um I didn't I, I personally don't really believe the the vertical growing facilities that I see that uses sort of pallet stacking type technology, right? Where you, you stack up um, like in, in um, racks and you use scissor lifts to go up and work on them. That that they use way too much uh, people to, you know, transport things up and down. It's too complicated to automate. Um, and, and you get uh, different temperatures at different levels, different humidity at different levels. There's all sorts of issues there. Um, the Artecna system was the first vertical system that I actually believed in. Um, it's very new. It only came out a uh, little bit over a year and a half ago. They haven't built many of them yet. Um, and uh, uh, our grower, she comes from the Netherlands, you know, families in that area where this is being built, the, they got good reputation, etc. So I believe in this, but essentially it creates uh, a, a much easier automated facility uh, from the point of view of it, it. You don't have to build so much technical infrastructure that's spread out very, very widely. Uh, I know the conversation at Nexus Aurora around food is that it, it, people say it's cheaper to build wider from an energy point of view, to buy, build wider uh, systems that are flat, one layer, uh, than to try to run uh, vertical systems with LEDs. And that might actually be the case. So that's something we have to look at from a Mars perspective. Uh, but building this in Sweden, where property is expensive and um, actually spreading yourself out doesn't really give you all that much benefit because we don't have much light, etc. Um, that quickly gets offset uh, through different ways by having a vertical system like this one. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's lots to talk about on that. So let's stop there. Okay. Well, it, it is a good point because um, even on the Mars Society competition, we, we considered the difference in planting very fast south, where you'd have low levels of light, very close to Sweden, if not worse, and close to the equator, which we'd get quite good lighting throughout the year. Um, and what this does show that at least both are, are possible, that there are two models, and it's not just um, this or that, but there's, there's actually various options available. Yeah, we had a master student do calculations for his master thesis, um, comparing greenhouses in at our latitude with a vertical growing system. Uh, not actually not a vertical, but with an indoor growing system with our pilot, um, and they they came out fairly similar energy wise actually, because of an, a, a greenhouse in Sweden you have to heat it a lot and light it during the winter and the summer you have to cool it. So, so you know, it's uh, it was interesting that it wasn't a huge difference. Um, and that might be an indication for what we need to do for the Nexus Aurora base as well. Thanks. Um, one more question, a silly little question is, so I see there's a backup system and yeah. I, I looked at your pumps and it looks like you've got a lot of dual pumps and things like this. How dependent are you on technology of this thing working 100% of the time? Is is there... 100%. You, so if 100 you have in the job, you got trouble. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 when you have bigger fish tanks, um, you're going to have maybe a little bit easier time because there, you've got more volume. But in the end, you're going to have much more dense population of fish. So it probably evens out. The... the, the um, uh, the critical point is the fish, right? Uh, 
think that you know we have a t thank you with me to fish tank it's it's like a small very small room it's like a small toilet right uh, in the in that fish tank you have um, uh, you have up to you know 200 kilos of fish and they're going to poison themselves with ammonia or they're going to run out of oxygen or both if the fish doesn't get replenished water all the time um, so we you know we have to keep replenishing that water with the, so the ammonia moves out and you know fresh water with fresh oxygen comes in Talking about that, um, I've got a question from from Sam actually. He's asking, uh, talking about the discussion of micronutrients that you're talking about that now. Uh, what what inputs do you need to put into the system that's not provided from just the food or the fish itself? Uh, do you have like other other inputs that you need to give in on, especially on the nutrients to keep the fish and the plants alive? At the moment, um, we put uh, we put a little bit of water from our well in. Uh, uh, we add um, how much do we add we add about a couple of hundred liters uh, a day to our system uh, and that's because the drum filter that we use flushes uh, some of that water goes out into the uh, into a, a uh, waste tank um, actually a, a, a tank for manure um, so it takes out the fish waste that way uh, that's how the system sort of technically works. We're adding a little bit of water, and that water is groundwater, so it contains some micronutrients. Uh, other than that, uh, we add, we have a 34 cubic meter system. So there's 34 cubic meters worth of water in our system, uh, total in the, in the troughs, in the sump tank, and all the piping, as well as the fish tanks. And we add about uh, half a cup, I mean, four deciliters worth of iron, chelated iron, uh, every three weeks or so. Uh, chelated iron is, I think we're at 6%, I think, of iron in, in that liquid. So, you know, so we add one ppm uh, every, to our, our whole system once every six weeks. We're probably going to add a bit, a little bit of potassium as well, because I think we have a bit of potassium shortage. Um, I don't know exactly how much, but it's small volumes. And we add, uh, at the moment, we add a quarter of a litre of 25% um, uh, what do you call phosphorus in an in a acid format. I can't remember what it's called right now. But anyway, the, I mean, you literally have 34 cubic meters of water, which is quite a lot, and you add like half a cup every three weeks, you know. That's like the extra nutrients beyond That's the fish food. And these things all sound like things you can get pretty much quite easy. This isn't specialized. Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I, have a, I have a 20 liter uh, container with chelated iron in it. That's probably going to last me the whole year. For this yeah. scale, yeah. obviously, you know, bigger scale, you need more. So that picture of that you had on your stacked um, farm that you've got, the, uh, tell me quickly. You there's a picture of like a little robot arm on this thing, and yeah. you. I, I remember you talking earlier about um, automating a lot of these things and getting robotics involved. At what stage, because I know there are people doing this, but to me, when I look at it, the, the, I see these really, really expensive robots doing like a, a easy person job. What level are we at in terms of automating the whole process? Um, and what are your views on that? Um, I can't really tell well exactly that because we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, I know that, I mean, in Sweden, Salaries are relatively expensive, uh, which means that automation is something you do quite early. Uh, just as a comparison, I used to live in the UK, in London. Uh, somebody came and needed to dig up the road to replace a pipe in the road or something like that. There would be four guys coming and they'd be digging and whatever, um, and and you know with a truck and the, you know. In Sweden, 
you know, one guy shows up, he has like, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of machinery with him. He does it all by himself with that machinery, and then he goes again. That's how Sweden operates, right? The, yeah. So, so automation. I mean, these kind of robots. It's a uh, lifting plants, moving them into new places, or whatever. That's all a solved problem. The Dutch have been doing this for a long time. Uh, so, so it's just a matter of calculating. You know, if you have a robot doing this all the time compared to a human, when do you break even, right? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, these are particularly simple to automate salads and herbs and things. It's harder to automate picking tomatoes and uh, restringing the plants, moving them, picking off leaves and things like that, that you need to do to multiply, but it's coming as well. Okay. Uh, I've got a, I've got an interesting question from somebody from the gardening subreddit. Uh, this is from the Red Hound 19 and he just wants to know which row is your recreational row? Which row of all these plants is my recreational row? Yes, which your recreational uh, planting row? Well, the, the basil one, because <laughs> I don't smoke. <laughs> um, I eat. I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if you're some uh, specialist in aquaponics hidden away in a lot of basements around the United States at the moment. Oh, in, in the US, the, the, you can check out the uh, uh, on YouTube, search for aquaponics and, and uh, growing uh, recreational plants, and you will find uh, quite a lot of material there. Actually, they're they're deep into this. I'm sure they are. And um, I've got an interesting um, question from the permaculture subreddit, um, Motherly Pirates, uh, and and he says, or oh, she, if it's a Motherly Pirate. I'm a director of a greenhouse in the Arctic and these type of products we are working on. There are a few places on Earth that are similar to Mars in some ways. Darts on the TV looks really interesting. Thanks for posting this. I'm going to check you out and I'm already getting ideas of our own projects. So it's just nice to know that um, there are interesting projects like yours really in the funniest place yeah. on Earth already. Yeah, there's a, there's a European uh, pro supported projects with uh, some space agency or whatever that's been working on uh, that there's a facility in the Antarctica where they would be growing tomatoes and other types of plants in a hydroponic system like this uh, in a closed system in uh, you know Arctic Arctic type base so there is work going on like this uh, I, I just felt that what they were doing was interesting but it was so small i mean it was like a container size that i'm like okay i want to i want to get my feet wet on bigger things uh, and that's probably more practical to start here uh and then we can figure out how do we do that uh you know in more hostile environments once we have this up and running I'm sure, um, especially I believe as soon as you start introducing insects, but you need to learn how to grow these. And um, I mean, you're in Sweden, it's quite cold for a large part of the year. Um, and Arctic is actually the extreme. So it's, there's a yeah. whole range of complications. Yeah. Um, there, so I don't know if you know much about the soil conditions of Mars. Um, there's a lot of perchlorates in the soil yeah. of Mars. Can you talk quickly about the soil that you use or the growth medium that you use? Is it soil or do you have, you have some other substrate? We, we use cocoa fiber. Uh, so cocoa fiber uh, is used. You can use things like, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it? Glass fiber plugs or whatever other things. You can use uh, clay pebbles. You can use gravel. Uh, depending a little bit on how you build your systems. Uh, we use cocoa fiber because that, that's easily accessible. It's a biological component, uh, can be uh, composted, etc. later. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the cocoa fiber in our system is only so that the plant has something to hold on to, right? And, and the plugs we use are really quite, they, we have, we have two different systems that we're trying at the moment. One is 
more like a, a small pot and the other one is a plug and the plug is like no more than like an inch across um, if, if even that uh, and it's just so that plant has something to hold on to and then underneath the raft where it's on the, the, there's roots and they can be up to half a meter long the roots uh, in the water so so but the plant to be able to stand up and for the leaves to be able to catch uh, light it needs to have some stability to hold on to that's where the substrate is for that substrate's really just a, a bit of a foundation it, it's actually just yeah. to hold the plant upright and yeah. doesn't actually do anything beyond that wow uh, it, it actually contains some nutrients in the bag as it comes so it helps the plant when it's very young uh, but but apart from that uh, it's it's just a foundation as you call it I've got a question, this goes back to almost a running cost question um, from somebody in aquaponics and this person says that they they see a lot of empty uh, warehouses and they've always been dreaming about setting these things up. Uh, you've talked about um, your current setup is you guys have um, land for free and things like that or you're, you're renting it from, from one of your investors. How How hard is this to set up on a like an industrial center or do you need do you actually want to be on a farm where you've got certain equipment and a space um or does this make well, sense it, in the city it it um it depends like most of these things um in sweden we could do it in the city um uh you, you have to work out your numbers, your economics, uh, how, how big part is, is your rent going to be? Um, you're, if, if you're, like in Sweden, if you're close to some location that has district heating, uh, that might offset the cost of the rent if you're, you know, renting a warehouse or something. Uh, because you can get like um, something like maybe half of your electricity cost back from the district heating company. Stockholm has a huge district heating network um, and you can take the waste heat from, from your lamps and your, in your system and, you know, race it with heat pumps to a higher temperature like 60 degrees and push it back out into the district heating system. The problem in Sweden for me is that any location that has district heating uh, it's also a very expensive location. I mean, I, we looked at some a, lo a logistic center point north of Stockholm, and we looked at some land. And for the the land that we could buy, we could easily build a really large, nice facility on some cheaper lands somewhere. So it all becomes an economic calculation. You need to work out what can I sell, how can I make this work, you know. How much profit can I make? Well, you, do you need to go through distributors? How much are they taking, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, remember, uh, agriculture, food production—the people that produce food in fruit, our food production system—they don't earn a lot of money. So it's a tough thing, right? Um, I mean, the the supermarket sometimes makes more money than all the uh, people in the chain, including the producer before them do. Right? So we're looking, so we're looking to sell directly to restaurants, hotels, conference centers and stuff like that, and not go to supermarkets at this point because we can't afford to. Uh, we're competing with cheap product built, you know, produced in Holland, produced in Spain, Morocco, whatever, uh, quite far away shipped in. Uh, so we need to reach much, much larger scale than what we are producing for our next step to be able to afford to compete with those to sell into the supermarket. Um, so I've got another quite an interesting question. This is actually an important question. And the, it's actually from two separate questions. But the first question is, are we only going to be eating lettuce on Mars? Um, uh, the other question, and I know you've discussed this before um, uh, on, on a private chat with us um, in terms of what, what can we grow, but the other question is then in terms of uh, calorie density 
and um, you've talked about getting um, uh, about a thousand plants per day in a thousand to three thousand three hundred square meter facility. Um, but wh how many? How, what does that translate to in terms of calories? And what do you think is possible? Discussed this before um, in terms uh, of on, like, supplying chat with us. Total uh, overall calories. In terms of what, um, what can we grow? Requirements for but the other question is then. Um, first of all, you know, obviously we're not into live of salad, right? We're we're not we're not rabbits. Um, the the you can grow, you know, different types of salads. You can grow a whole bunch of uh, you can grow tomatoes, paprikas, cucumbers. You can grow, um, you know, we know you can grow bananas, mangoes, other types of fruits in systems like this. The question is, is it economically viable? Uh, so for me, it might not be, but on Mars, it might be, right? Yeah. Because you have different economic context there. Uh, the, 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 the fish production system uh, is as the fish component is should be as uh, cost effective as any kind of land based aquaculture uh, but you're also taking the nutrients to produce all the vegetables with um, uh, I need I need a master student to come and do their thesis on the nutrient stuff I don't actually know the answer to that question I don't know what the nutrient uh, I mean sorry not nutrient the the calorie density of a system like this. I don't actually know the answer to that. But there's no, there's no thing hard limits on growing, uh, say for example, corn or uh, walnuts or an avo tree on a system like this, obviously changing the scale. You, I mean, I, I think it's going to take a long time. I mean, Morris is a special case. It, yeah. On Earth, you, you're never going to grow, you know, wheat, in an aquaponics system. That's not going to happen. Uh, people are going to grow that out in the open field somewhere. Uh, you, you, need, uh, you need highly specialized, costly crops. Uh, I mean, in things like, uh, uh, you know, on Earth, we do silly things like, uh, in sweet state blueberries, you know, on Christmas or whatever, in the middle of the winter. Where do these blueberries come from? Uh, they come from Chile. So they've been shipped across half the world. And, and a blueberry is primarily water. So we shipped water across half the world uh, to eat them in Sweden. I can grow, you know, strawberries in this kind of system instead locally. Uh, even if Swedes normally only eat strawberries during the, the summer, if I actually start producing really tasty strawberries all year, I bet you they're going to get eaten, paid for all year round, and people are going to be happy because they're not importing from the other end of the world. So, yeah. so it's all about economics. On Mars, it's different because importing food from Earth is going to be way more expensive than importing it from Chile. I don't see hard barriers in, in, in terms of the technology being able to do that. Um, there probably are some. Um, um, but but in the end, you need to then create. I mean, in our diagrams that we've been showing, you know, we've been showing pieces like uh, uh, where you say there's local agriculture as well. So you know, you're going to have on Mars at some point, you're going to have probably local agriculture under some kind of dome, right? Yeah. Or okay, yeah. Radiation shelter. So you, you're probably going to mix aquaponics with other things. I mean, you're not going to only run aquaponics. Thanks for that. Um, so another question from Kun is: um, I'm sure you've seen our concept where the in our Mars City State design, we've got these roofs with water overhead, and the idea was that we can have fish swimming overhead. Um, yeah. What do you think of that? Uh, is is that something that looks feasible? I, I think it was designed by somebody who'd been to a really nice big aquarium. Uh, uh, and, and you have tunnels that you walk into and the fish are swimming around you. I don't personally think it's particularly practical for a fish farm. First of all, um, uh, you know, a, a, a fish farm normally has quite a lot of fish in it. Um, the fish, uh, 
I mean, it really a lot of fish. Nothing like you see in an in a aquarium if you go uh, and look at it. Um, you know, you you can have up to sixty, seventy kilos per cubic meter worth of fish. You 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 wouldn't see the light. Well, you would, but not much, right? Um, you also, you know, you you also need for things like uh, the type of fish that we're doing. If you do salmon or salmonoids like trout. Uh, the, the, the water needs to stream, so it needs to be in a circle so that you can get them to swim, or you need like long runs. Uh, that might work. Um, I, I think you could have some fish in the, a system like that, for, but I, I'm not sure if it will be more for decoration purposes than actual practical. Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, I think your main fish production is going to be in a dedicated very compact fish production facility. But I might be wrong. Talk, talk a bit more about the fish. Um, do you breed the fish within your system? Um, and then at the moment we can... don't. You don't? So at the moment we don't. We take them from a fish farm nearby, uh, which is bred in outside dams uh, from a stream, because uh, our system is too small. Um, the next level system, we will probably take in eggs uh, from uh, egg growers, you know, a producer of eggs somewhere uh, up north in Sweden. They have a good um, breathing facility there. Um, so we would probably, we could potentially go from eggs all the way up to, you know, completed full size fish to eat. Um, but uh, I mean, you can, it's just that you don't want to do everything on premise sometimes, it becomes too complicated. That's it. Uh, are you planning on doing that when you get to your, to your next phase? Yeah. I, I assume you want to close everything up at, at some point. Yeah, but yeah, but you, we want to take in as many externalities as possible that's practical, but at some point, you know, you have to make a choice. Is it is it better to get somebody specialist to do that for you? Like, yeah. We don't make our own hardware. We buy hardware. We might buy fish, fish, fish eggs too. You know. Okay. It's, it's, um, you you spoke quickly that you've got uh, solid waste filters that you're still taking a certain amount um, of of like things out of the water. Um, tell me a bit about the the outputs of the system that goes to waste. Like uh, I know in almost every agricultural process, there's there's waste that needs to go somewhere that can't really be reused as, as well, or it's really difficult to reuse. Uh, do you have any, any waste like that? Like, do you sit with filters that you're chucking away, or what's the case there? Well, you get, I mean, a quarter of the weight of the fish food becomes some kind of fish waste. I mean, poo, sludge, right? Uh, that, at the moment, in our pilot system, that goes out to a, a, um, a fertilization tank that's used to fertilize uh, fields around us. Um, but we're going to, the idea is that we're going to take that in uh, and then you'll let that sit in tanks that you bubble with air for a month or so. And that breaks down considerably longer then and releases the nutrients that are captured in there because like phosphorus, three quarters of the phosphorus that we actually want in the system that ends up in the sludge instead and we can take care of that by going having that go through a separate biological process so that's something you want to do and, and when you do that you end up not having to supplement uh, much less essentially much less supplement of nutrients uh, you're still probably going to need to do some potassium and some iron but uh, but you essentially get uh, a better uh, biological cycle that way. Um, imagine the, this whole chat. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. But I was going to say that the, uh, at the end of that process, you have very, very little uh, fish sludge left, and uh, whatever you have, you can use on local, local other agriculture because it's really good uh, uh, soil improver. A little bit about the ratio between fish and plant area. 
uh, because it looks like the, 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 the space that you're using for, for growing fish is very small compared yeah. to your full plant growth area. Yeah, uh, it depends a little bit on the type of fish you have, etc., etc. But we normally uh, uh, we normally calculate some, you know, something called the golden ratio. Let's see if I have the numbers because I can't remember the numbers at the top of my head at the moment. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ask me a different question while I look at this up. Uh, I've got a question from Tay uh, Taylor Higgins, and you've kind of sort of answered this. The question is, what do you feed fish on Mars? And you spoke about feeding them insects. Um, yeah. Now, now I I'm, I'm curious about how does, and I looked at your, your graph, the, uh, this image over here as well. Oh, sorry, not this image, the one that you had at the end, which there's a relationship yeah. between insect and your plants and your fish. Um, can yeah. you talk a bit about that? Because that's that's obviously a, a bigger a bigger relationship going on there. Yeah, I mean the, the uh, you get, you're going to need quite a lot of. Uh, I mean, as an example, if you to, to feed to feed a fish um, uh, like a, a trout, uh, you need dry food. The, the funny thing is when you say, um, I mean, when we feed them in systems like this, you need dry food for different reasons. Yeah. But, but the funny thing with it, with it is that often people say we, we have one kilo of fish feed and we get out 0.9 kilos of fish. But it's a, that's a dry yeah. fish, fish feed and then there is a wet fish, right? It contains water as well. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship truly. Uh, and, and normally trophic levels, I mean, you lose a tenth of the energy as you go through them. Um, the, the fish are different because they're cold-blooded animals. Their temperature regulation, they don't do that. They, they're in the water. They re, they, they're regulated by the water they're in. So they're, they're actually very efficient uh, creatures. Uh, and some type of fish, like tilapia, for example, uh, can eat a more plant-based diet. Uh, they're not really vegetarian fish; they're omnivores. But but you could, they could get away with eating less, right? So you could imagine, you know, feeding them a, a more vegetable-based diet uh, than you would do with a you know a trout, for example. Um, and then you know you need to put you know two or three kilos of of vegetables into an insect, you know, vegetable waste into an insect for that to become, you know, one kilo of something that you can feed a fish with. And then that's going to be one kilo wet again. So when you dry, it's going to be less, etc. So there's a whole process that you go through. Uh, I mean, the best thing is if you can eat algae directly yourself, right? We don't do that. So we have to go through a few steps. You could feed algae to shrimp, and then you can eat the shrimp. Or you could feed yeah. algae to mussels, and then the mussels could become good fish food, or insect food, or food for you. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's even it's even so that through a few steps, our waste products, you know, when we go to the toilet, could be used. It's it's obviously can be used in local agriculture because we've done that since we invented agriculture, but it could be used in these types of systems too. But you always have to think about, okay, how can we shorten the number of steps you go through before you have a product that you can eat? Um, I know that's not maybe the quite the, the answer you're looking for, but um, it takes quite a lot of work to work out exactly how you can do this and then make it the most efficient. And what we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to make something that works competing with linear, more wasteful methods but still making sufficient amount of money that we can survive doing this and evolving it. Um, the golden ratio, uh, we talk about uh, fish feed relative to square meters of growing area in a, a system like this. And we talk, normally talk about, for cold water fish, we normally talk about 25 to 35 grams 
per square meter per day. So 25, 30 grams of fish feed per square meter per day. That's the ratio that we use. For, for uh, tilapia, it can be up to 60 grams per feed per square meter uh, per day. Uh, um, tilapia is normally happy in like 28 degree water, whereas trout is more like 15 degrees. And I talk uh, Celsius now. Yeah, of course. The, the only measurement. Uh, the, you, you talked a little bit about mussels. Um, now, I've actually got a question here from, from someone called Andronis. Um, and they say, I've considered using mussels for dealing with uh, bioflocculants before on a moon based mm -hmm. project. However, part of the life cycle is parasitic and requires specific fish, fish species to be compatible with. This may also be problematic trying to take back the larva after they drop off the gills. How is this managed? First of all, I've never known this. I just thought mussels just spontaneously appeared on rock. <laughs> it seems like a complicated process. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I can't say I know myself. Uh, the, the mussel part comes from, uh, we, we live in Sweden, we're next to the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is heavily polluted by nutrients. It's got way too much phosphorus in it. Uh, it's lying on the bottom primarily, but it, we also add it from the countries around it. Um, if we can plant a lot of mussels there, we're gonna, they're going to take up those nutrients and put them back into our food system. But it's a brackish sea. Um, it's not, you know, got, not with the same salt levels that you have out at the Atlantic, for example. So the mussels become very small. You're not meant to eat these small, really small mussels because is to, I mean, you can't sell them today like that, but you could crush them, give them to a soldy fly. We know this, it's been done. Soldy flies love to eat them up and leave just the shells behind. And the soldy fly then becomes a really good fish feed because it now has the omega 3s that you need from the algae that the mussels ate. Exactly how that process could be done in a closed system, I don't know today. I'm sure there's somebody who knows, but I don't. Um, so I've, I've got a question that I've been wondering, and and you obviously the best person to answer this at this point is, what, so to get a system like this, now right now you've got quite a lot of the things in, in, in a closed off system, but there are a lot of these inputs and outputs uh, that you need as well. And, and as you explain it, it's largely because a lot of these things just make sense on Earth. We've got big dams, close by, so why not use the, the those dams as a resource to, to assist with your farm? What would it take and what big hurdles do you see that to completely close the system off? Like if you had to put it on Mars and say, okay, fine, we're not importing anything. What are the big hurdles uh, in doing that that you see at the moment? I, I think they're similar to uh, you know any, any type of close, closing off a system hurdles, right? You need to scale so it doesn't become so vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's, you, you're going to be dependent on an awful lot of technical equipment and, and that technical, actually manufacturing that technical equipment. I mean, we, we, we get yeah, pumps from China, we get computers from China designed in the US, we got software from all over the world, we got, we got, um, you know, nutrients from fish feed that comes from, you know, different companies in different countries, they're all sorts of, I mean, the, the, the supply chain, the food supply chain that we have, uh, including all the technology, is humongous, right? There are so many interdependencies. Uh, and, and working on boiling those down to a few, that's probably going to be the, re the, the hardest part. How, how do you standardize on components to the point where they, that when you're kind of going, oh shit, I need another oxygen sensor because mine is broke, because they do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or pH sensor, whatever, and not having to ship it in, that's going to be the really hardest thing, right? I mean, manufacturing all of those things. Partially, away. I mean, you're two years yeah. away if something goes wrong. Yeah, part, part, partially, um, we we thought about this not so much for the Mars 
point of view but we want to learn from the beginning so we built our sensor system for example from as simple as possible components we could get rather than buying everything pre-assembled so we bought really cheap sometimes crappy stuff or online is co2 sensors and whatever they were badly configured or couldn't be configured properly or whatever we learned along the way how to do this sort of at a, at a lower level than you maybe normally would have done because we really wanted to learn this stuff from the, from the basics we built a lot of what we built in wood rather than buying uh, metal things or whatever because it's easy to do prototyping in wood uh, you might not want to do that when you build a large-scale system but then I mean the on Mars there's not going to be any wood in the first place yeah. uh, so I, I you know it's Obviously, the first systems that you're going to ship, if you're going to ship to another planet, they're going to be, you know, IKEA flat packs. <laughs> it's going to be, here's your aquaponic system, assemble it, here are all the reserve components you need for the next five years, you know. I'm, I'm glad that you, you mentioned something in terms of scale, because I think that's, that's going to be very important. If you have a system that's good for 100 people, and you know what a system that looks for 100 people is, and you need to feed 100 people on Mars, you'll ship two of those systems because you can't afford to just ship one system um, because one, uh, and a question that's come up a lot is what happens if you've got a virus break or there's some root rot or something that goes through your system and you need to close down a part of it for, for a while? Um, yeah. So you need, you need bulk and you need redundancy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we should also remember that, uh, you, I mean, uh, you, you, you could make sure you don't get too many uh, you know, things like parasites with you when you go, so you will have, probably have less of a problem, right? But you're certainly going to have some problems. They're never, you're never going to avoid having fungus with you. Fungus spores, there's no way you can get rid of all of them if you're going to start shipping over thousands of people. Um, you will, you, um, but you might, you, you're not going to have, um, you know, uh, creepy crawly type parasites. Right? I mean, you, you're going to yeah. ship, you're not, in, you're not going to ship live fish to Mars, you're going to, you're going to ship eggs, most likely, right? Yeah. Um, eggs are relatively easy to sterilize, uh, so that they, uh, there are very few bacterial or viral things that live in the egg transfer that way they often sit on the outside of the egg so you can sterilize them and take them with you so you also said with better closed systems um so what what i find interesting is on earth we we've got a bundle of uh, on any farm and i presume your systems as well uh, your system works very much with the bacteria in the fish gut and in the water and those help uh, break down and develop the nutrients for the plants. Uh, so this is relationship between bacteria, your fish, and your plants. Um, and on Earth, it's really difficult, as far as I understand it, to isolate the bacteria because it won't be a bacteria; it'll be a million different types. Whereas yeah. on Mars, you'd be able to sterilize the system completely, maybe, and then select bacteria. Is is this something that you think could actually be done? And is it worth even looking at that, or just taking the bunch of bacteria that we have now and taking it across I, not an expert uh, I'm, I suspect that you could take uh, a bunch of bacteria cultures that you think are suitable for this uh, but I don't know how far along we are actually identifying the full bacteria cultures right and that are, are involved in this uh, I mean I know for a fact that there are researchers as the at the Swedish Agriculture University looking at these relationships between bacteria and plants that we didn't really look at before. And they, they, they've most, I think they've done most of their work on, on worms. I mean, you're the, the, the brown things that crawl around in the soil. Right? Um, before we thought maybe that it was the fact that they chewed on things and made it, broke it down smaller and then they made air canals, you know, crawling around in the ground that made the big contribution to the plant but we th think more now that it's actually the bacteria culture and the break the, the 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 different side products when the bacteria does it work 
that actually helps the plant more. So, so, um, so there, there's a whole bunch of that research to still to be done, I think. Um, I quickly want to ask you a fish from, uh, this came from Anjonas. Uh, in terms of, so you, you're using a lot of tilapia, and I know from smaller projects similar to, well, I want to say similar to yours, smaller projects that also use fish, definitely not similar to yours, um, definitely not in the level of complexity. Um, but tilapia is generally very well used for this kind of thing. What about other um, types of fish? Um, there's, there's catfish, for example, they're very hardy. Is it something you yeah. can consider? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, in uh, tilapia is the most common fish. We we use rainbow trout. Um, the, there's uh, clarias, a type of catfish, uh, is also very hardy, uh, being used uh, here in Sweden as well. Um, there, there are actually lots and lots of types of fish that can grow in uh, aquaculture systems you know, land-based aquaculture systems that could be used in this context. Um, you could use shrimp, definitely. Uh, so, so there is, there's a, the whole, there's a whole bunch. Uh, uh, I think most of the fish that's being used at the moment is either be used like tilapia because it's simple, or like a trout or salmon because it pays well. Um, so I think we're going to see quite a lot of development on that going forward because, uh, I mean, you. On the Earth, uh, we, we're not into. We, we can't fish more fish out of the sea. All the the places where we fish are either overfished or at capacity, and and all the growth in fish, uh, available fish as feed or food for humans, it comes out of aquaculture today. Um, but aquaculture can also be quite, um, uh, you know, environmentally damaging if you let all the new excess nutrients go out and, and that's why I think things like what we're doing are going to make sense. I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more question. We're at an hour and a half now and I think this is pretty much um, the time for, for this uh, live stream. I want to run, ask one more question before I'm going to close up. And the question is on electrical consumption that's asked by Nick and it's generally a, a lot of question a lot of people ask and we did touch on it earlier. Um, he asked, so at the moment you're running um, about 900 square meters, um, and he says you're using uh, 2.8 megawatt hours a day. Is, is that correct? Because that's a lot of electricity. You said 2,800 kilowatt hours a day. Is, is uh, I'm correct? not running that at the moment. That was the calculation for one of these R techno cells, right? Okay. Is that the, the so, 1,000? So, so, so. It's, it's a quite simple calculation that we do at the moment, sort of finger in the air, but still, right? We, uh, if, if we light the plants artificially with LEDs of the quality that is available today, we have LEDs from Philips. Um, if we light them, uh, then we need about 100 watts per square meter, right? Okay. And, and, the, everything else that we run in our system, pumps, cooling, other things that are running around our system at the moment, uh, is about 50% on top of that. Okay. So you can, you can do the calculations like that. Uh, when you get really large scale, the cooling becomes easier because then you can do stuff like ground cooling. You can, you can pump down a, a liquid down into pipes in the ground and on Mars it's going to be very cold. So that, that liquid, something that doesn't freeze, uh, is going to allow you to cool away excess heat uh, much easier. I mean, it's, it's compared to, you know, other types of cooling mechanisms, it can be 20, 30 times more effective. And so that's going to lower your costs dramatically. Uh, but I mean, that's, um, that's what I'm cal calculating at the moment. Uh, per, uh, you know, growing area square meter, I need 100 watts, uh, 18 hours a day. 18 hours a day. Hmm. That that, oh yeah, that's, so that's actually not as bad as we thought, but that obviously also depends because you're on one level. So as soon as you stack, it's essentially going to be 100 meters. Well, it's per square meters. Per yeah. 
Oh, if yeah. you go stack 10, le- 10 left floors, you now have 10. So they have a kilowatt per that square meter. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to end, end the, the stream here. Thank you very, very much. I thought this was extremely informative. And uh, it doesn't stop here. So we're going to keep on talking about these things. Um, and at, at Next Aurora, we, we're going to take this information and keep on developing our concepts because we want to get hardware on Mars and on the moon one day. Um, for those of you that are busy watching from YouTube or don't know about a Discord server, just please click on the, the Discord link and join us there or subscribe to, to follow up on, on other videos that we'll have. Um, and we're going to continue doing this. We really want to get some hardware um, onto Mars or onto the Moon. We, we're trying to see if we can get some um, experiments out to the Mars Society's um, Mars Research Base in at the end of this year. Uh, oh, sorry, next year. Um, and we'd like to actually get some hardware and test some things out and see how they actually translate into a, a hardened environment, into a pure desert, and maybe maybe we can get a small aquaponic system there as well. That would be kind of cool. Um, but yes, if you well, it's it's possible, and it it'll be interesting to see because as yeah. you have mentioned, you need to start small and need to start on the simple things, and then we we scale up. Yeah. May I add something? Um, all the work, all, all the work we've done on the software side so far is actually open source. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to ping me if you're interested in some of this stuff, and we'll see what we can do more together. Um, if you ever happen to get by Sweden, um, come and visit our facilities. It's a, this pilot is an open facility. Um, so um, you know, and we're also going to try to answer more questions that we, if we didn't get yours. Um, uh, it's a good place to go to, I think, the next is Aurora subreddit. Um, yeah, so so for those that are listening on the YouTube, please come join us at the Discord. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to end the live stream. For those that are on the Discord, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the end, uh, because we're going to do what we normally do and talk late into the night about farming, and then we can open up the, the floor for everybody to ask questions. So um, thank you, Adrian. Adrian's been helping in the background, streaming and getting questions sorted out and doing some admin. Um, and uh, Kun for helping set things up. Yeah. Um, thank you, Thomas, for the for the talk. And I really hope that we have another chat like this and we can get this, uh, the news of what's happening out there because we can't rely on one company to do everything on Mars. It's going to be a huge undertaking. Um, yeah. And hopefully, with enough people like Thomas, we can actually get this get this done and build cities on Mars. So, thank Absolutely. you very much. So, uh, I'll be closing the stream, but not before thank mentioning you. that uh, we are also inviting other uh, projects to present on our um, platform. So, I'm going to open the floor, Adrian. I think you can stop the stream if you want. Um, but at this point, I think it's going to be open conversation for everybody on the Discord. Guys, open your mics and you can ask away. I'm sure there are a lot of questions I didn't get to cover or a lot of things that haven't been answered yet. Yeah, just a small um, note before we close. Um, we open an invitation to more projects to present in this uh, live stream format. So if you are working on something related to aerospace, be it like hardware, software or like concepts, mission concepts, you feel free to reach to us and we are going to set up a live stream for your project as well. So thank you so much, Thomas, for taking your time today with us. It was absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, the stats are really great, so <laughs> you'll enjoy all the rest of the comments. Um, we will do many more of these uh, presentations and uh, yeah, I think it's becoming a weekly habit for us. So <laughs> thank you for joining.